Uh, we had a, a very good discussions on the on the last panel, and we very much look forward not to let you down your expectations this time. Uh, my name is Victor Kipiani. I'm a chair of Geokeys, and as a, someone with a legal background, I would be very much timeful of the very strict timing instructions I've been given. So I would also encourage distinguished panelists to help me in this very honorable and uh, a bit, you know, hot endeavor in terms of timing. Let me, let me present the uh, panelists uh, to the immediate left of uh, me, Mr. Temur Kekalidze, who is the head of the Border Police of Georgia, the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Next to Mr. Kekalidze is Ambassador H. Vidas Bayaronas, Ambassador at Large for Hybrid Threats, uh, Republic of Lithuania. Then Mrs. Alina Inai, Director of the Bucharest Office of the German Marshall Fund. And next speaker, next panelist, is Mrs. Biserka Banisheva, member of the board of the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria, director of European Affairs at Pan Europa Bulgaria. Thank you very much indeed. We really are ready to go ahead. Uh, Black Sea region is something, you know, which appeals to the Georgian agenda very closely for obvious reasons. Uh, I all, uh, also very much welcome um, uh, very right reference in the concept to this uh, forum which was speaking and which is speaking to new thinking, new skills and new partnerships. This is especially important, you know, for the Black Sea region, which for many, many years has been a venue for multiple roles, especially for trade, but these times it becomes a region for, unfortunately, intensive competition of great powers. Therefore, you know, when I was thinking about picking up the questions, it was, you know, a myriad of various issues which uh, popped up on agenda, and uh, yeah, it, was, it was really very uh, hard, you know, to be as selective as possible because it's really a unique platform for showing the implications of geopolitics, geoeconomics, etc., etc., and it's it's really a good case study to for scholars, pundits, and researchers. It is also the fact that uh, although uh, the North Atlantic Alliance has rediscovered itself in the Black Sea region in the course of Bucharest summit. It was for the first time in Warsaw when they pledged their presence in the region. And that pledge is something, you know, which has been repeated and reiterated in various statements of either NATO summits or NATO Georgian uh, statements. And the very recent one was, uh, the latest statement was made in Batumi when the North Atlantic Council mentioned about new priorities of the, for the coming period. With that in mind, since the black region becomes, is becoming a sort of, you know, new defensive perimeter uh, at the extreme eastern flank of the lines, and as if, you know, placed on the fault lines of two normative worlds, one world is that of democracy and liberty, and the one is authoritarianism and oppression. The Black Sea region and us and uh, Georgia as, as, as a country, uh, which, is, which is in, the, in that region, uh, it requires special significance and special meaning. In view of the Russian attempts to build up sort of, you know, a new iron curtain running across the lines, of, of, of the Black Sea. Is it right to speak nowadays about sort of, you know, re-emerging a new containment policy by the West, which runs across the Baltic, uh, Black Sea? And in view of that 
containment policy, which is, which is sort of, you know, a suggestion from my end, and I, I could be completely wrong, what could be those priorities which the Atlantic Council and the NATO is speaking about when they focus their attention and their discussions on the Black Sea region? So that would probably be my uh, sort of, you know, uh, the, the opening question. And um, this is the fundamental question, and we'll, then we'll go, you know, to more specific ones, where I would kindly solicit, uh, um, sort of, you know, your views, each of you, and, uh, well, let's start with uh, Mr. Kekelidze, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor and privilege to be in front of such, of such a distinguished audience. Uh, with a clarity, being the head of the Border Police, uh, I'm also supervising the Coast Guard, which is a part of the Border Police, and the Coast Guard is the only naval force in this country. Now, so uh, whatever comes with NATO, Georgia, Black Sea, practical cooperation, it's uh, um, my agency which has to be, which has been implemented by. So in that sense, uh, I'm not quite irrelevant. Uh, so, now, uh, Black Sea is indeed a, uh, a part of being our natural habitat as such. It's uh, in an inalienable part of the Euro-Atlantic security. The three littoral countries being a NATO members, uh, two, Ukraine and Georgia being an aspirant countries to NATO integration, and, uh, well, and there is Russia. Um, and uh, oh, in the last decade, the, the region has seen the dramatic changes uh, in the last decades, both with the uh, enlargement of NATO and the EU, with uh, Romania and Bulgaria becoming part of the NATO and the EU, and again with the Russia's uh, aggression against Georgia and then later on the, against Ukraine, has seen the, has actually changed the landscape, security landscape of the Black Sea, and of course they, of this uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, in the midst of, the, of this uh, politics, uh, of these events, uh, the, the Russian, what we now call the hybrid activities, uh, was always an underlying, underlying factor. Uh, and the, when we speak about the so-called hybrid wars, or hybrid warfare, or hybrid tactics, this is something which uh, has been become a term, I mean, after the Russia's illegal and illegitimate annexation of Ukraine, is something term which has been coined in the West after, after uh, annexation of Crimea, I'm sorry. Uh, however, this tactic is much, much old. So uh, the, the, while the West, if I may say so, has discovered the hybrid uh, warfare after the annexation of Ukraine, it's been applied by Russians at least for the decades. And if, if you look at the uh, conflicts uh, in, in uh, post-Soviet space after the in, in, in early 90s and then later on, we can see the pattern of the of the tactics which Russia has been using both in in, in Georgia in uh, Georgia's Central region and Abkhazia as well as in case of Moldova or in case of conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh. So basic line is that actually when it comes to the Black Sea and the Russian hybrid tactic is that to create the zone of the conflict in the country. And with this, uh, the controlling the, uh, the those zones of the conflict, and then uh, keeping those uh, conflict zones as a leverage against those countries uh, or targeted countries, in order to prevent their integration toward the West. Because uh, from the very beginning of the of the of the uh, collapse of the USSR and, and the, the new Russia, emerging new Russia, the uh, NATO enlargement has been something which Russia tries to prevent uh, all the time. And the Black Sea region is one of the uh, primary area where Russia tries to prevent this uh, uh, this enlargement. Uh, and the Black Sea countries has been suffered, I think, quite well, uh, quite uh, severely with these tactics. Uh, again, I mean, we, speak, we spoke about the 90s. Uh, later, it was Georgia who experienced uh, the deadly cocktail of the Russia's uh, coercive tactics, uh, being an economic blockade or an energy sabotage uh, or a uh, military pressure, and later in 2008 again, uh, open and blatant uh, invasion and the occupation of Georgian territories. 
And actually, this was the first time where, since the collapse of the Soviet Union when Russia has openly invaded another sovereign country. Uh, of course, uh, in the 90s, it was Russia's military uh, elements who've been present and who've been basically reshaping the, uh, the, the conflict and the outcome of the, uh, of, the, of the combat, but they had never actually admitted this. So in 2008, it was the first time when Russia has openly invaded a uh, sovereign country uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which I think was an um, uh, alarming turning point in Russia's foreign policy, which has become even more assertive than it used to be. Uh, and unfortunately, when we, uh, when we have been speaking to our Western friends uh, about that it's not some isolated case, but the continuation of Russia's the policy, even with more aggressive stance, uh, we, uh, at least I have the impression that we have not been heard properly. Then again, the annexation, illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea has been another turning point because, uh, again, this was the first time when Russia has annexed a part of the sovereign country uh, without any pretext, basically, without any conflict in there, uh, officially annexed, and then instigated the conflict in the eastern Ukrainian uh, provinces. And the, it was the same uh, kind of uh, blueprint of the, of the conflict instigation which we've seen in the, in the 90s uh, in, in Georgia or elsewhere across the Soviet Union, I mean, again, Caucasus or Moldova, etc. So basically, uh, what we see is a very active Russia's uh, strategy in the, in the region, I mean, which is becoming more and more aggressive. And it's extremely alarming because with this new <clears throat> policy, it's clear that Russia is increasingly uh, relies on the use of force uh, aimed at uh, not only preventing the country's uh, Western or European or Atlantic integration, but also uh, just simply to altering the borders of the sovereign countries in Europe and uh, annexing their uh, or, occup or, or, or occupying their territories. And this is something which uh, undermines uh, inter existing international uh, law and order, and it's blatantly violates, of course, international law. Uh, uh, one of the interesting factors of the Russia's hybrid tactics, again, this is this is uh, the deadly cocktail of everything. I mean, starting from the propaganda, or cyber, cyber attacks, economic pressure, covert and open military actions. Uh, but one of the uh, factors, at least in this region, uh, what I've seen is that Russia, at the end of the day, needs always to engage militarily. I mean, with the conventional military elements, I mean, they need to engage at the end of the day. Again, in Georgia, it was simply open invasion. Later in Ukraine, it was so-called battalion tactical groups, which of course they never admitted, but everybody knows that they were there and reshaped again the outcome of the combat at the end of the day in, in Donbas and, and, and Lugansk. So uh, there are different uh, elements of Russia's hybrid tactics and one of the underlying elements, at least uh, if you look at the statistics of the 90s and then later uh, of, of, uh, of 2008 and 2014, uh, uh, year events in Ukraine and Georgia, all the time, despite all this uh, economic or uh, energy, I mean, uh, pressure, despite all the propaganda, all the cyber attacks or whatever they may have in their uh, sleeves, uh, at the end of the day, Russia needs to engage the, op I mean, the conventional military forces. It's also, I think, the characteristic of, of Russia's you know, hybrid tactics in the region. Uh, and they, of course, I mean, they, after the annexation of uh, Crimea, uh, the uh, deployment of Russia's uh, military, military elements has been increased considerably, actually altering the balance of power in the Black Sea region, because uh, we've seen the uh, very impressive display of force uh, and uh, creating the so-called zones of the uh, anti-access area denial with the, I mean, impenetrable zones of the anti-access area denial capabilities across the Caucasus and uh, in, a, in a large part of the of the Black Sea region. <coughs> and uh, again, the uh, two military bases which are stationed in, in, in Georgia after the occupation of 2008 and all these uh, forces in Crimea, 
those are not random elements, those are the part of the Russia's uh, South military district. Uh, they routinely participate in their trainings and uh, they are part of the larger military machine and this military machine, at least this is again uh, my assessment, is not directed against one particular regional country. This is a large force, very large and impressive force which uh, uh, is uh, uh, able and which is ready for a potential conflict with a much larger opponent than any individual regional country uh, and this only such, such I mean, organization which I comes to, the, to my mind is NATO. Uh, and also, I mean, with these uh, forces, they can project power not only across the Black Sea, but also beyond it into the Mediterranean. And we've seen that Crimea has been used uh, as, a, as a major um, uh, base of supply and uh, operations for Russia's activities in, in Syria. Um, well, this is something which, of course, poses a direct threat to Georgia uh, and to Ukraine, to that matter, but it's something which also, I think, uh, very alarming to NATO, and uh, the one of the question is if NATO doing enough for countering. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, so. Uh, we'll get to okay, then I'll just stop here, I'll just with well, a couple of not quite, uh, I mean, optimistic notes that again, I mean, uh, uh, while the Russia has been using the same tactic, tactics in the 90s and perhaps in earlier, I mean, uh, with the digital era, with the development of uh, global communications, uh, their hybrid capabilities have been amplified. Uh, many, excuse many me, folks. excuse me for jumping in. You know that that that's been extremely important. The notes which you've just made, and we'll get to the specifics of the NATO uh, policies in the region and uh, Russian hybrid. So, I take your response, and that's been very helpful insight. You know for a. For, a, for, for, a, for an individual, you know, from an individual, you know, who is just in the middle of the game, in the middle of, the, of this battle, I would say. And thank you so much indeed. Uh, I just, no, no, I uh, want to finish with, with the final. Okay, please go. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, what I want to say is that actually, uh, and this is, not, this is not the end of the story, this will develop further. I mean, the Russian hybrid activities, or just the hybrid activities of any country, <clears throat> to that matters, will evolve further with the development of the, of the technologies uh, and of the capabilities. No one Thank done. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I've noticed that uh, most of us are from the Black Sea countries, except of uh, one panelist who is from the Baltic region. And that, that's very, very helpful coincidence, Ambassador, because from your perspective, uh, from the perspective of Lithuania and the Baltic region, in terms of my question of this sort of, you know, the Black Sea caught containment or Iron Curtain, you know, how do you see us from your perspective, you know, how do you see effectiveness of those pol priorities of those pol policies in the Black, Black Sea region? Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction, you know, someone outside the region. You know, when you sit among the friends, you drink the uh, best uh, mineral water in the world, uh, I do not feel outside, I feel like at home. This was a joke, but anyway. Uh, to, be, to be serious, uh, uh, indeed, uh, all the, 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 first of all, thank you, uh, organizers, for inviting me. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, since I, am, and I noticed that I speak already for the second time in, 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 in this uh, event, NATO Information Days, that means uh, organizers still believe that I should s have something to say, which I, I, I need now to, to confirm whether I will not disappoint them. Uh, the title of this, uh, of this event, uh, of this, our panel is, uh, is uh, Black Sea, indeed, uh, as you, Victor, said, and, 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 the, co and the country hybrid threat. Uh, and uh, I will come up to this, but I absolutely want to reflect to what you have said. What are the sort of Baltic Sea region, uh, sort of uh, lesson learn what, what we can we can share. Definitely, I'm not coming here as a sort of preaching you the the, 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 the truths because there are no truths. We all are in this development phase. Hybrid, uh, although this is a recent phenomena, but as uh, Temur has already been uh, very well alluded to this, this is uh, something with us for 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 decades and and and, and actually not even centuries with different form now technologies and globalization have changed it but uh, 
but uh, and, and it, would, it would remain. Now we talk about uh, new forms, uh, deep fake. There are new. There is uh, we our our Lithuanian Eastern your northern neighbor is not uh, going going to change to democratic uh, Westminster democracy soon, and we are li need to live up to this. That is this is for for, for long. So I structured my short intervention uh, very much also reflecting what, what you have asked Victor about on what are the achievements so far, what are the still shortfalls uh, and, and then what to do. So briefly on, on achievements and I really uh, appreciate Teimura's very well overview on what are hybrid threats and which was very much uh, common be it Black Sea or, 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 or Baltic Sea, there are, there are no different geography probably historical patterns, but otherwise it's, it's very similar. What are, the, what are the achievements? One of the biggest achievements that, uh, that uh, there is a growing understanding in, on what is hybrid threat. Usually, when I attend conferences, you skip this introductionary part, which was not yet case three, four years ago, when you still need to convince your Western friends that uh, what Russians are doing in Georgia, Lithuania, meddling election disinformation is not something of us, it's of all of us. And this is what uh, I think now we have reached the stage where in the West, thanks you all, thank you in brackets of Russian activities, meddling elections, supporting radical political parties, uh, cyber disinformation attack, the uh, awareness what the hybrid is, is growing dramatically. Few years back, speaking with the Spanish colleagues, they would still refer a hybrid threat as sort of Eastern European related. With uh, Catalonia engagement of uh, Russian disinformation attack uh, using uh, Venezuelan bots, again, uh, global world, uh, there is a clear understanding. So this is I, I would highlight as the first biggest achievement. Uh, again, uh, second, there is national understanding of in many countries what to do. Again, I can share you some Lithuanian highlights, but they are not would be something of Lithuanian know-how, coordination, the whole of government approach, which actually a good friend of Lithuanian Georgia, Ed Lucas, calls it uh, the whole of society approach, which I, I buy his, his uh, terminology even more, because this is not, nothing to do with the government. The, the whole of government means only government. We, all of us, I will come up to this. Coordination, sharing, uh, sharing, uh, sharing uh, sort of within the government, uh, the, the threat perception, and so on. I can go and go. So this, uh, I, I travel country to country, you see more and more countries are up to this level. Spain, uh, Greece, and, and you, I, I can name even countries which would be outside uh, traditionally sort of uh, uh, countries of, of this um, first echelon of response. So this is also biggest achievements. Then uh, if I, if I uh, although this is NATO related event, but uh, I, in our uh, strategy, we, we have NATO and EU together. So I will start from uh, an EU. European Union, uh, you know, if those you don't no notice, but I would definitely pay you attention. This June, European Council agreed on the new uh, strategic agenda of European Union 2019-2024. Five years strategic agenda. So new commission, which hopefully will take force 1st of uh, December now, uh, they will be bound with this new agenda. First time uh, hybrid threat, disinformation, cyber are mentioned explicitly. So new commission will be not anymore talking that, you know, uh, this is not something not for us to do. This will be the guiding document. So this, is, this would be not imaginable a few years ago that European Commission would be in charge of the countering hybrid threat. A joint uh, working group on countering uh, hybrid threats and, uh, and enhancing resilience. Disinformation action plan, last year's European Commission uh, code of conduct engaging big, European, uh, big world social media platforms uh, in, uh, to, to force Facebook, for example, to clean their contacts from from fake news and so on, uh, European Commission's uh, uh, activities on protecting elections from money, money sort of uh, party financing to, to the disinformation. So everything goes really in, in, in good direction, uh, not least to mention that EU is not only reacting, already starting to, to think what is in NATO jargon is called deterrence. So the sanctions on cyber 
sanctioned on CBRN. This, is, this would be not imaginable a few years back. NATO, last uh, uh, June we agreed on counter-hybrid support teams, dedicated NATO teams uh, which would travel to our country's support in, 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 uh, in, in hybrid attack. Uh, but, uh, but this is only one element, uh, you know, cyber strategy, uh, the, the NATO's, I, I think Ambassador uh, Ilan Tachan spoke about NATO's activities, I, I will not uh, highlight. NATO's Center of Excellence, Energy Security, Cyber, Tallinn, uh, Stratcom, Riga, all of them I, I employed well into the NATO's reaction. But also there are worldwide activities, uh, uh, G7 uh, rapid response mechanism for protecting elections. Again, that was unimaginable. G7 uh, centered in Canada, uh, Ottawa uh, Secretariat, in supporting, uh, protecting, election, uh, protecting dem democracies. Uh, there are many more platforms and international engagements, but definitely I would, uh, uh, I would, uh, I would ask I would, uh, my Georgian friends to pay, to pay more attention. Center of Excellence in Countering Hybrid Threat, where I am on the steering board representing Lithuania, starting from a humble nine countries two years ago. Last week in the steering board meeting, we accepted Turkey, 24th member of the board. So if you, if you take NATO EU overlap membership, there are 32 members. So we expect soon all NATO EU members uh, will be in, in, on the board from TTX, tabletop exercises, to research, vast, uh, vast, uh, vast uh, uh, the, the, the scope of, of, of activities not only talking, but also doing something. But uh, this is probably the end of my positive side list. Uh, and I would just, a few uh, issues I start to highlight, what is still missing or what I see uh, biggest, uh, biggest drawbacks. Although, as I said, understanding is growing. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, what Teimuras was uh, describing to us about general Russian patterns is more or less agreed in, in horizontally in many capitals. But when you reach political elite, there is still sort of, yes, but you know, yes, but, you know, Russian money I invested in London Stock Exchange. Russia's, Russia investing in energy companies. This money are then coming back and hitting us, democracies. Are we, are we continue to allow this? Are we not able to, to make, I'm mean, not against investment, uh, transparent uh, investment, be it from Russia, from anywhere. But they are not transparent. They are grey money traveling in our countries and hitting us. So this is what uh, the question is. NATO EU, again, uh, in, 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 in papers everything is okay, but when you reach sort of highest level uh, echelons, you still see this hesitant to re seriously counter Russian. Russians are, and, and other, other actors uh, now on, on in the market, uh, Iran, China, they are, not, they are doing this because, not because they are great, because we are weak, and this is, this is the problem. We should be more united, we should be more up to the technolo technologies, and we, we, are, we can able, we can do this. And th this is what uh, I'm always struggling to understand, why we, the West, and the, here I also have Georgia and Lithuania uh, uh, as part of the West, big West, why we are not capable to defend us, uh, because <coughs> this is not about Lithuania or Georgia, this is about our democracies. And that's what I think there is not yet understanding that, uh, where, we, where, where we stand. Uh, sorry. And then the th th big third element, which I, I, I miss in this mosaic. Uh, there are few people in EU, NATO, who cares about Georgia. And this is the problem. About Georgia's resilience. There are some NATO EU documents which refer to the resilience, uh, countering hybrid threats. But, uh, but there is, uh, you know, we, you are our future, you are your future EU NATO members. And Easter Party is, was established as, again, as one of the elements of EU pro policy. It's established to bring you closer to us in, in the future with a, with a membership perspective. But, uh, but when I see the documents and also action, there are no specific NATO, EU oriented uh, clear strategies how to support your countries in resilience building. And this is what uh, you know, I think is a big missing element. And I, I here I definitely uh, would continue to ask also your active uh, participation as Georgian government and uh, 
NGOs community to, to sort of lobby that this will be high on the EU NATO agendas. There are some good achievements. Uh, I've, I've been supporting and also following NATO Ukraine hybrid platform, which is sort of loose uh, network of uh, activities. Uh, there, uh, there were a few events in Vilnius. There was a recently big conference in Kiev on countering hybrid threat in the framework. Uh, Vilnius Center of uh, uh, NATO Center of Energy Security is now preparing the tabletop exercises with Ukraine on, on critical infrastructure. So it's, there are some elements, but still there are no in big package of support. Uh, but not only support, we need Georgian experience and Ukraine experience as a frontline countries of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of this hybrid warfare. You know more than us uh, on, on certain issues because many tactics uh, uh, by penetrator being developed and, and tested on you, sorry to say, and then this transferred to us. So definitely this is not only our interest to support you, but it's our interest to, to get your knowledge uh, on board. So what to do, and this is I am finishing in a in, in few, in few minutes. One, of course, is uh, definitely uh, nobody will do the job in, in, in instead of Lithuania or Georgia. This is our national obligation to invest in resilience building, in uh, free media, in uh, in, in, in uh, coordination activities, uh, and this is what uh, I, I, I get definitely, I can only offer Lithuania's experience uh, if it's, there is interest to Georgia, and uh, I know there are some recent uh, talks about Lithuania's uh, Stratcom expert uh, uh, sharing experience uh, and cyber expert, uh, so we can, we can, we need to support each other, but this is national, national prerogative on, 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 on countering uh, hybrid threat and uh, and, and building, building resilience. We need still to, uh, to bring uh, hybrid, uh, countering hybrid threat and kind countering dis dis uh, disinformation, cyber, on the high, high political uh, level. And here, of course, uh, political sort of uh, maturity on, in understanding is, is critical. Lithuania, you know, some countries say, we are the champions on countering hybrid threat. But not because we are perfect, because I, as an official, I have strong political mandate by my leaders that this is the right course. We should speak up what Russians are doing, speak up clearly, not just say, you know, we cannot react to cyber attack on, on or disinformation after one week. We are lost. This, this case will be traveling and poisoning uh, uh, information space. We should react, we should uh, get a uh, strong response. And, the <coughs> and this starts from from high political mandate. Uh, this is what uh, I, I still see the missing. Definitely, definitely I, I, as I mentioned, I want Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and us, all of us, to be more active in, in bringing this issue with, <coughs> with the NATO EU agendas, that the resilience building of this region is of our interest. It is not like tomorrow, it's now. And this is what I believe, uh, we in, especially, for example, now in current, uh, our discussion on the future of Eastern Partnership. And this is again very much back to the, to the core issue of the, of the Black Sea region. This, is, this should be part of the future e Eastern Partnership agenda. And here definitely you should be very active as well. Um, <coughs> I, I, mean, I was mentioning Center of Excellence in countering hybrid threat in Helsinki. We've been discussing also how we can assist Georgia uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example in, in, in countering hybrid threat. But the problem is we don't, uh, we don't want uh, just to come with a, just yet another seminar about hybrid threat. That, that is not in your interest nor in our interest and this is a waste of time. What is, would be important if uh, there would be few countries <coughs> like Lithuania, UK or, or other you know, NATO EU consortium which would come to Georgia and try to identify together with you what are your key issues. So, whether you would be interested in coordination. Here, of course, I say Lithuania is not perfect. Fin Finland, probably, or, or even UK would be perfect uh, case, test case. Or whether this disinformation is of uh, interest. Here, definitely, I would, uh, I would mention Lithuania with uh, state-level coordination of Stratcom with the Lithuanian Alps and uh, Gedrus, my colleague, will speak on the next session. A good uh, media engagement, media freedom, cyber and so on. So we want Georgia to specify what are your key critical issues because we cannot just talk about uh, years and years about hybrid threat. This is uh, 
this is uh, in interesting you know, as an academic uh, exercise, but it's not bringing closer you, neither us, to the, to the core business, to, 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 defend, uh, to defend democracy. And this is probably, I will finish, uh, uh, short introduction. Thank you. Your, Your Excellency, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> now, now I understood you know, why you've been invited again to participate because, you know, yeah, because, because honestly, uh, Frank, I mean, the, the honesty of your response you know, is something which we all need on the Georgian side. And that's something you know, which we look very much look forward to, to less bureaucratic responses and more substance and more tangib tangibility. Otherwise, yeah, we are sort of, you know, and then really, you know, your, your, your open-minded response is very much appreciated. Uh, having said that, you know, Alina, what would be your, your, your take on the issue, please? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'll try to stick as close to the seven minutes I was instructed to stick to so we can engage into a, into a conversation. Um, I do have the wonderful privilege of having a regional view sitting in Bucharest, yes, yet, however, working throughout the, the entire Black Sea region. And I will want to talk about two very specific issues. As the ambassador said here, to talk about hybrid threats in general doesn't quite get us anywhere. I want to talk about informational war and I want to talk about destabilization of politics and societies in the Black Sea region. When it comes to the informational war, and I will refer to Russia, there are other actors, uh, state and non-state actors, which, um, uh, who undergo informational war, but I will refer to Russia. So when it comes to the, to the, to the, interfa uh, to the inter uh, informational war from Georgia to Romania, even if languages are different, societies are different, histories are different, um, approaches to Russia are somewhat different throughout the region. Russia is, however, employing the same methods or the same combination of methods depending on the country where it, uh, where it uh, that it targets, let's put it this way. First of all, we are all familiar with fake news. They are creating fake news through their army of trolls. Um, and they are distributing this fake news or news that they put a spin on, not only through their army of trolls, but through very many useful idiots, uh, which are in the media, which are in the society, which are influencers within, uh, within all of the countries in the Black Sea region. And I think that, you, uh, that the, the number of these useful idiots and using these useful idiots is the, is the most um, dangerous, if you want, if you want method, because it's something that is now growing organically within certain societies. We don't need the army of trolls anymore because we have our own um, uh, germs, if you want, our own viruses that carry on uh, Russia's messages. Um, then, of course, in some of the countries, I include Romania here, I'm not sure about Georgia, although from what I read it's the same. They also use, use the church extensively to distribute their messages and to also uh, uh, get people to act um, in a certain way. When it comes to messages, what is very interesting is that the messages that, that, that Russia is trying to put in our heads are not necessarily pro-Russian messages, like Russia's great, uh, you should join Russia, although this might work uh, in, in some countries, probably Georgia included, but these are anti-Western messages. Other outright, Western is decadent, Western is immoral, Western is rotten, you shouldn't have anything to do with the West, or, which has started lately, more recently, just putting spins and uh, uh, debunking, if you want, issues that the West stand for, gay rights, environment, um, free market economy. So everything that is associated with the West, it's being turned around, it's being spinned around, and it's being, um, it's being pointed at as, you know, evil. The second thing that Russia is doing wonderfully, I might say, is that the is destabilization of politics and of society. And they are doing it either directly putting money into political parties which are pro-Russian or which stand for something that Russia stands for, which is usually um, um, against, against, against the West, something against the West, or they just support issues that polarize societies. And I think, again, this is more difficult to track and this is more dangerous because what we end up with, it's a society at fight with, with, uh, with itself. It's a, a, 
Romanian versus, versus Romanian war, Georgian versus Georgian war. So it's people going against each other and on a highly polarized society, it's very difficult to achieve reforms. It's very difficult to have a consensus on which way the country should go. It's very difficult to really build, nurture, and, um, and um, um, uh, have democracy. What should be done? And then I'll tell you uh, what I, we observe as, as being done. First of all, it's very important that there are short-term approaches and long-term approaches. And we are very bad at both. When it comes to short-term approaches, of course, we should immediately debunk the, uh, the, uh, the fake news. We should put the truth out there. You can fight propaganda with propaganda. You fight propaganda with the truth. We should put the truth out there. And there are ways in which probably using AI, but not only, we can, we can even be proactive and put the truth out there on an issue that we know Russia is going to put their army of trolls around, like the anti-missile uh, shield in Deveselu, Romania. That's something that should be continuously monitored. Everything that comes out of it should be well prepared with the population knowing the truth before Russia puts, uh, puts its spin on Americans raping Romanian girls or whatever they, they want to invade um, on a certain day. And then very easily just follow the money, follow the money that goes to political parties. This is really easy to be done. You fix the legal frame, you have the watchdog uh, groups uh, doing their jobs. It really is very easy to be done, but not, not even that is being done. Um, but then, most importantly, you also have to have long-term approaches, which is building resilience within the society which is to address all the vulnerabilities which are there within the education of young population, within the media, uh, within, within the way the messages flow within certain societies, because what Russia always does, always, is it's built on our vulnerabilities. It doesn't invent anything necessarily, but it builds on something that already, a little small virus that is already in the society, and. And that's what makes everything that comes out of, uh, of their propaganda machine uh, very, uh, very credible. Um, and then, again, we have to popularize our point of view. We have to explain to the population through media, through every means we have, that the West is not decadent, that Russia is rotten, that there is no democracy in Russia, that people live very bad lives in Russia, we are not doing this. We are very, very, very shy of explaining what Russia stands for and what goes on there, while they are not shy at all, uh, you know, saying everything is bad in, uh, in the West. We should be a little bit more, um, well, assertive when it, when it comes to this. Um, and I will end in, um, in a minute. What also needs to be enhanced is cooperation between NATO and the EU when it comes to informational war, when it comes to destabilization efforts. This is very, very going on very poorly. Um, also, NATO has to make up its mind what hybrid threat, or what is its response to hybrid threats. It's still unclear how, how far will NATO go in in the case of a cyber attack, and I think Georgia is the best example of a very recent cyber attack. Um, and what will NATO actually do about information or war? It's just a lot of talk without no clear, no clear action. And last but not least, um, I have seen some responses being built um, um, in some countries in the Black Sea region. These are weak responses because there is no coordination within a certain country, no interagency, interdepartment, intergovernmental uh, cooperation in order to address either of the two issues I was referring to. And there is no cooperation or exchange of experience between countries in the region, which I think it's, 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 it's a pity because the experience in the, is the same. Um, and we can build on each other's not only vulnerabilities, but, but small successes that, uh, that we have. This would be it. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for bringing sort of, you know, new dimension into our discussions, and that's been really very helpful. Uh, may I sound your view, Asena, please? Um, thank you. I'm uh, representing uh, another Black Sea littoral state and uh, one of the three NATO members in the Black Sea region. Let me first uh, start uh, by 
uh, underlying uh, the support of Bulgaria, the EU and NATO member for the Euro-Atlantic aspirations of Georgia to underline our uh, contribution as uh, acting three times as a NATO contact point in Georgia. And I will see our ambassador here. Congratulations, Ambassador. Well done job. Um, my intervention uh, would be on what uh, NATO and the EU are doing on hybrid uh, warfare because we have to understand it's not a specific issue for the Black Sea region. It's a global issue and needs, uh, uh, so to say, uh, global, global reaction. It would be the security challenge of the 21st century for the Alliance, for our partners. Uh, the colleagues, the panelists uh, already described uh, hybrid methods of warfare, particularly focused on our, on our region. And um, what is new about uh, hybrid uh, warfare is that uh, attacks seen in recent years uh, are speedier, the scale is larger, and they're more intensified, facilitated by the technological change and the global interconnectivity. Um, as I said, uh, uh, what is being decided and done at NATO level, um, I wish to, to emphasize it. It has been decided in Warsaw, and we are referring to the Warsaw Summit several times today with regard to decisions, uh, but there is one more decision regarding uh, hybrid uh, warfare, which uh, I want to, to stress upon. And uh, I quote, uh, the challenges posed by hybrid warfare were, were a broad, complex and adaptive combination of conventional and non-conventional means and military, military, paramilitary and civilian measures are employed in a highly integrated design by state and non-state actors to achieve their objectives. Responding to this challenge, a strategy and implementation plans on NATO's role in countering hybrid warfare were adopted. But we have to, to, to be uh, very honest and say that the primary responsibility to respond to hybrid threats or attacks rests with the targeted nation. NATO is uh, prepared to assist uh, allies at any stage of a hybrid campaign and uh, the Alliance and Allies will be prepared to counter hybrid warfare as part of collective defense. Uh, the Alliance is committed to effective cooperation and coordination with partners and relevant international organizations, and we come in particular to the European Union. Uh, according to the, again, Warsaw Summit uh, declaration between NATO and the EU, um, that the declaration outlined objectives of a strategic partnership to make the Euro-Atlantic area safer. When we have uh, a common set of proposals endorsed in the areas of information sharing, coordinated planning, including measures to bolster resilience to hybrid threats, ranging from disinformation campaigns to acute crisis. As part of our uh, increasingly closer partnership, uh, NATO and the EU have stepped up cooperation on dealing with hybrid threats with special focus on countering cyber attacks. We also uh, putting in place concrete measures to increase situational awareness, which will contribute to our response to hybrid threats. Uh, the centers of excellence have already been uh, mentioned by the ambassador and I want to uh, emphasize the role of the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats located in Helsinki. It is uh, an initiative of the government of Finland. It's supported by NATO and the European Union. That uh, center of excellence serves as a hub 
of expertise. Uh, it assists participating countries in improving their civil military capabilities, resilience, and preparedness to counter hybrid threats. The inauguration took place in October 2017 by the NATO Secretary General and the European Union High Representative uh, on Foreign and Security Policy. I'm mentioning the Center of Excellence because it is a good model, it's a good example uh, to be used, I mean the experience of the Baltic Sea region to be used as experience in our Black Sea region. Because in the Baltic Sea region there are also other uh, centers of uh, uh, excellence uh, um, the Communication Center of Excellence in Riga, the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn, the Energy Security Center of Excellence in Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, so uh, this uh, model which uh, the Baltic states uh, are using uh, should be transferred to, to our region. I also want to share with you that uh, and uh, we are talking that uh, the Black Sea region should be more on the attention of NATO and EU leaders. And uh, I want to refer to the latest meeting of the NATO defense ministers and the issue on uh, countering hybrid uh, threats, uh, cyber defense uh, coordinated exercises. Uh, uh, these issues were discussed uh, at dinner by the NATO defense ministers with the European Union and Sweden and Finland. And I'm mentioning Sweden and Finland because these are non-NATO members and they were involved in, uh, 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 in our uh, efforts to, um, to achieve greater uh, stability and security in, in the region. Uh, it has already been described how the Black Sea region is exposed to hybrid, uh, uh, to hybrid threats. Uh, and uh, it is uh, quite clear that uh, uh, stability in the neighborhood uh, of the Alliance uh, is uh, contributing to the stability of uh, the Alliance as a whole. Uh, the Black Sea region cannot be isolated when we discuss the stability and security in our neighborhood. Uh, because uh, what is uh, being done under hybrid, uh, specific hybrid operation is to explode national vulnerabilities. Military, economic, social, informational infrastructure um, and to use instruments of power that extend far beyond the military realm. And all these characteristics are witnessed in the Black Sea region in recent years. Um, it has already been said several times, but I shall also join uh, the panelists uh, on their assessments that uh, over the, last, uh, the past few years, Russia has steadily upgraded its military posture and matched it with uncompromising and assertive information campaign. The latest uh, and probably most serious threats to European security architecture, openly challenging the established world order, have occurred in the Black Sea region. Russia's conflict with Georgia in 2008, the illegal annexation of Crimea, the continuing destabilizing activities in eastern Ukraine, Beyond uh, using conventional military force, Russia is applying asymmetrical means of warfare in this region aimed at disturbing and incapacitating the nation's sovereign decisions and other processes of democratization and Euro-Atlantic integration. A number of uh, NATO member states, non-governmental organizations have been vocal about Russia's activities which aim to erode democratic institutions. There are numerous reports describing the toolbox and options Russia is uh, using for this. Among the most visible actions is the active propaganda campaign which aims to create new or reignite old historic issues which make cooperation in the region less likely 
while at the same time undermining trust in Euro-Atlantic institutions, including both NATO and the uh, European Union. As a result, the entire region is weaker, less open for integration and dangerously prone to subversion. A regular instrument of choice is the spread of fake news and conspiracy theories, many of which suggest a hidden Western agenda. More often, the aim is to fuel anti-establishment grievances, including direct support for political parties with anti-NATO agendas and anti-European agendas, polarizing societies and feeding Euroscepticism at large. Uh, I want also to, to share with you that uh, uh, in my, my own country, we are also uh, having uh, such, uh, um, um, such, such challenges being uh, EU and uh, NATO, NATO member. Uh, we have been subject uh, to disinformation campaigns activity by trolls, uh, spread of anti-NATO myths through specially created for that purpose news online platforms, media websites. Disinformation activity normally intensifies and serves as a strong tool, especially in election times. Um, it was also uh, mentioned by panelists uh, the need for internal coordination. In my country, in response to what is happening uh, in the um, geopolitical area. In March 2018, we um, updated our national security strategy comprising self-assessment of critical functions and vulnerabilities across all sectors, recognizing growing hybrid threats the strategy aims at enhancing traditional threat assessment activity to include non-conventional political, economic, civil, international tools and capabilities. Its objective is to coordinate a national approach of self-assessment and threat analysis and mobilize comprehensive cross-government efforts to understand, detect and respond to hybrid threats. NATO, NATO has it, the political cloud of its 29 member states and uh, now will become 30 and is uh, in the most advanced defense capabilities at its disposal for collective defense of each of its members. And NATO is lending, lending political support to partners as Georgia as well as helping them to build sound defense institutions that generate the capacity to protect their national sovereignty. With regard to hybrid warfare, it is proving more and more challenging to adapt and respond to hybrid tactics and threats. So, in our view, a joint uh, Black Sea threat assessment with Georgia and Ukraine uh, should, be, should be done. Um, we also think that the lessons learned from the Baltic experience of engaging non-NATO partners in strengthening regional security, Georgia and Ukraine are important Black Sea security in the same way Finland and Sweden are the Baltic regional security. We think that uh, discussions and raising public awareness on these issues is uh, an ongoing and continuing uh, uh, process and on our part I'm representing the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. Uh, it is a non-governmental organization established in 1990. We were the first from Eastern Europe joining the Atlantic Treaty organization even before the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your extensive response, which prompts me to uh, run by you the very quickly question, which I should raise as a, as a matter of my sort of you know, privileged position, and then we'll go to, to the audience to take a few questions. When we speak about Russia, we're not discovering a new story for us. We know already Russia always behaves itself like a besieged fortress. And uh, the, the, nothing is changed in that respect. You know, the Russia's policy vis-a-vis -vis its neighborhood has been uh, keeping that strategic depth 
to prevent, you know, an entry point by passing its neighbors, you know, to shape its internal policy and informational policy. And that's always been a sort of, you know, consistency of Russian policies in that respect. And uh, the, the, whether it's uh, proclaimed under the Primakov's doctrine, etc., it doesn't matter. Content, the essence remains the same. But my, my question is that from our optics, and we've touched on that, uh, Your Excellency, you know, the, in, in your speech, and Alina, in your speech as well, uh, what we do, and do we do enough to, uh, to, to tackle those threats, especially in the, in the, in the context of the, of the low in, in intensivity conflicts and gray conflicts, gray zone conflicts. It makes me to think that when we speak about the ethnic conflicts in Georgia in particular, those are not the ethnic conflicts anymore, but those are the conflicts with geopolitical clout. And that, that, that something, you know, which should help us to bring those conflicts, you know, to a much upper level and to different dimension. Because once we recognize that Russia using, you know, that mosaic of cultural richness around its borders and exploits, you know, those weak spots to stop that advancement of the West closer to its borders, those conflicts could not probably it's a very bold suggestion, you know, could not be termed or could not be qualified as purely ethnic conflicts, but should be viewed, you know, through geopolitical optics and dimensions. So just, uh, I, I appreciate it, it's sort of a complex issue, but your prompt response is, uh, then we'll please, if we start with you. Regarding the conflict or regarding, regarding enough? I, 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 think, I think that the, the, the ethnic conflicts, because of the reasons <coughs> which I've mentioned, you know, right. are not, are not uh, sort of, you know, domestic conflicts anymore, but conflicts, you know, by, by, by geopolitical metrics and well, geopolitical uh, benchmarks. Thank you. Uh, I'll go in more bolder, if I may say so. Uh, those conflicts never been an ethnic conflict as such. I mean, there was an ethnic conflict on it, but those been conflicts fueled, fed, designed, and executed by Russia. <coughs> Again, I mean, if you look at the patterns, and we, we can trace, I mean, uh, those patterns even earlier, I mean, in the beginnings of the, when Soviet Union has invaded Democratic Georgia in early 20th century. So the pattern is that there, there is a specific layer of the society which needs to be protected from its own government. Well, in the 90s, that was an ethnic minority, or at some point, Russian speakers. In the case of Ukraine, it appeared to be the new term was so-called Russian world, Ruskimir. But the, the essence is the same. So there are certain layers of the society in the country, in the targeted country, which needs to be protected by its own government, from its own government, I'm sorry. And the Russia is the protector. And then propaganda starts. That's how it started. Then paramilitaries or some people see the buildings, the demonstrators are coming, uh, the, the human shield, and then appear the persons with the guns, prepared, uh, I mean, uh, trained, and all of a sudden, and, and then the, the conflict begins because there is no other option for the government other than to intervene, I mean, militarily. So to me, those conflicts, I mean, and I, not, I don't think that I'm the only person here in, in judging this, those conflicts have never been an ethnic conflict, just like it's never been a conflict in Ukraine or something like this. But, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a purely, by and large, designed by Russia. It's, it's oper operationalized uh, quite well because it's something which they've been doing in many countries for, for many years. And, uh, well, again, with the development of the technology, we spoke about the media and the, 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 the internet, etc. I mean, it just be be becomes even more, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's amplified and becomes deadlier. Uh, so, yes, absolutely, I agree with you, because those are not a conflict per se, I mean, it's a, it's a, which can be solved among the, within the, I mean, it's not an internal conflict, it's a conflict in order to ensure uh, Russia's dominant leverage over the particular country or the particular region to prevent, I mean, uh, their 
sliding us uh, to say, if I may say, so, I mean, uh, of those, those countries from the Russian political, economic, or whatever orbit it, it is, uh, to prevent their integration into the uh, European and World Atlantic institutions, which means that they, the Russia will have much lesser leverage on them. So the idea is that to keep Russia's dominance, so that's an idea, and to ensure it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, I don't know, the, I mean, the, the grand uh, Russia's idea and the, all those chim chimeric ideas which they still pursue. And the problem is that actually it's not even to safeguard Russia for uh, alleged NATO encirclement, which they, which they kind of, you know, tried to fade us for, for, the, for the decades and at some point even succeeded in some Western uh, countries. Because there was discussions, there still are, that if Russia feels uh, threatened by NATO enlargement. So, but that's not true because I think the Ukraine is a brilliant example of that because Ukraine has stopped any or whatsoever NATO I mean, integration process. Ukraine declared this non bloc status. Ukraine was uh, annexed, Ukraine was destabilized, occupied for the mayor association agreement with the EU, which has no political and military, I mean, connotations whatsoever. So the fact that actually, you know, well, the, the Russia does it because to prevent uh, NATO enlargement because it's too threatened, uh, well, it's not true. And if you look, I mean, uh, the way, if you analyze how the Russian military forces have been developed in the past decade, and if you analyze uh, how the uh, major NATO countries' military forces and the budget has been developing, actually, actually decreasing. So you see a stark difference when one, on, the one hand, on, the, on the one hand you have a increase, constant increase of Russia's military and conventional military, not just a hybrid, that's another story, but, con but it's two way, I mean, two sides of the middle, one middle. I mean, you see a constant increase of Russia's conventional offensive capabilities while all major NATO countries I mean, have been decreasing their military and defense budgets and have been focusing on the low intensity conflicts. Well, that's been, I think, well, it was a mistake and I think that it's now has been changing since Crimea. That's a good thing to do. I mean, hopefully it will continue this way. And now finally NATO has started to do the right things. So that's probably one answer to the other question whether NATO is doing enough. I don't know whether NATO is doing enough or not yet because I think that they still are in a reactive mode. But on the other hand, at least what has been, what we've seen after Wales summit in 14, after Warsaw summit in the, later on, how it's continued with the defense ministerials or uh, even the foreign ministerials, I mean, at least NATO is started to do what it has been designed for. I mean, so including in the military terms. Thank you. I'm, ter I'm ter terribly sorry. I should ask, you know, for, for two minutes response, if possible, each of you, and I'm mindful that the organizers would never call me again, you know, to this conference because I'm breaching all the, all the regulations in terms, of, in terms of time. But if you could please, you know, respond to, to, to that question in terms of sort of, you know, uh, requalifying or recharacterizing uh, the, the conflicts which are happening in the sort of, you know, the former uh, Russian influence or neighborhood, please. Oh, I'll give you a one minute answer. The only genuine ethnic conflict in the big series is Nagorno-Karabakh. Everything else is political and is being used by Russia to redesign the, the, its, its influence in the region. Look what's happening in Ukraine, going towards a federation model, which would ideally be replicated in Moldova, probably tried in Georgia as well. This is it. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Yes, Mosse? I think the, those from the region, they spoke well. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I can only come back to the same issues we spoke, and then I think the, uh, Alina mentioned very well, Russia is using all elements, and this is the ethnic uh, conflict is just not because of specific nation, because it's uh, just you know, one most visible and probably easy to, 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 to sort of amplify. So, so me method is the same. And Alina was very, very right here. You know, you see when you are a penetrating country, you see the big difficulties, and you you know on which issues to press. And that's why the the uh, you know when when I spoke about response, is is uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, you should be really be doing bad service to you if you would concentrate on Russia. You know, 
every, every, everyone is speaking about Russia, you know, how great uh, Russia is doing all the hybrid activities. We should speak more about ourselves. This is, this is what I believe this is essence uh, about our problems, about, uh, about the corruption, about the, about the, about the uh, social uh, sort of uh, differences which are hitting us and, 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 and being used by third Thank countries. You. Thank you, Excellency. 